Horror Story. She lay in bed trying to fall asleep. She could feel time running through the quiet of the empty house. The seconds turned to minutes. And when the woman finally decided to stretch out her hand for the watch on her nightstand, she found that instead of staring blindly into the dark for five minutes, as she had thought, it had actually been two hours. Creak. The woman gave a start. She knew that sound. It was a sound she had heard at home a thousand times a day, but normally she didn't pay it any mind. The sound of footsteps walking across the wooden floor. It was either from the hallway or the stairs. The woman lay still under the covers. She had her legs curled. The lower part of the duvet wrapped around her feet like a shirt collar around a tie. Ever since she was a child, she had been terrified at the idea that someone might slip their hand beneath the covers at night and grab her by the ankle. She would have gone crazy if she had had to sleep with her legs sticking out. Because they were waiting, and she knew it. The evil spirits. She curled up even more tightly, digging her nails into the covers. She inhaled sharply through her nose, with terror in her eyes, watching the small slice of room that wasn't hidden by the duvet. She saw the closed window, the wavy curtains, still as the sea. She saw a part of the wall opposite and a corner of the shelf. It was her room, so familiar and welcoming by daylight, so alien and hostile at night. In the dark, everything seemed different. The color of the wall was no longer light blue, but dark gray. The desk chair, her soft, quiet companion, transformed into a dangerous animal, best left untouched. Creak, creak, creak. The woman flinched in fright again. She crinkled her eyebrows, as if about to burst into tears, trying with all her might not to make so much as a peep. Those sounds again. They were coming from the stairs. Someone or something was coming upstairs. Someone or something was coming for her. It was probably close to 2 a.m. She only had to reach out her hand to the bedside table and check her watch. But the woman didn't do it. They might see the movement, and then they would know she was awake. They might be peering through the door into her room already, even now. The evil spirits. The woman waited in patient anticipation of the movement when a cacophony of frightening sounds would ring out through the house and the furniture would start to move, as it did every night. If only she were asleep. If only she could just fall asleep. She went to bed at 9pm in order to give herself enough time, but still it didn't work. The woman did her best to breathe calmly and steadily, but they still knew she was afraid. They knew she was afraid and that she was still awake. Creak. The sound of footsteps again, so loud and so real. It gave her goosebumps, and it was getting closer. Creak. 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 It was in the doorway now. There was no doubt. Someone or something was standing there, and that someone or something was looking at her. She could feel the intangible weight of its gaze on her covers in the silence. Cyril Clement leaned back in his chair and blew out a deep breath. He took a last gulp of his long cold coffee and moved the mouse to the X in the top right corner of his screen. Want to save your changes to Horror Story 1? Yes. Cyril was 55 years old. He had worked as a policeman and his decades of dutiful service had earned him an early retirement and a decent annuity. He was one of those tall, powerful men with broad shoulders and seldom hunched. In fact, the only time he hunched was when he wrote on the computer, pecking away at the keyboard with his two fat fingers, whether it was a police protocol or a short story in progress, he always felt clumsy and hapless, like Quasimodo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. He couldn't help it. 
That's how it was. As he searched the keyboard for the right keys, Cyril would furrow his brow, chew his lip, run his tongue over the hardest to reach parts of his oral cavity, crack his knuckles at disgusting volume, scratch his scalp, tap his feet, and, besides all of that, hunch ridiculously. Cyril's wife didn't like it when her husband hunched. It made her feel like he was losing the authority and dignity that she had so admired in him when the two of them first met. That was why she didn't like going up to Cyril's study. And when she did have to go, she always made sure to knock several times before opening the door. That way, she gave her husband not only time to stop writing, but above all, a chance to straighten his posture. Cyril had loved to write ever since he was a boy. In high school, he had even seriously considered taking up writing as a profession. But in the end, fear won out. He knew very few authors writing in Czech were able to make a living from it. And many more didn't even earn enough to buy paper for their home printer. So instead, opting for the path of a guaranteed salary and stability that came with it, Cyril had enrolled at the police academy. In his retirement, apart from the annuity, he supplemented his income however he could. For the past five years, he had been renting scaffolding to local builders, which brought in a decent amount of money in the summer. But it was winter time now, and the thick steel pipes lay unused in a stack behind the house. Cyril had been writing for an hour and a half, and his back was beginning to ache. Just as he stood to stretch, he heard a slow, quiet knock on his study door. Come in, he grunted. The door handle lowered and his wife peeked her head into the attic space. May I come in? Am I interrupting? I was just wrapping up, Cyril said. Are you planning to write any more today? His wife stepped to the desk and laid down a wicker tray covered with a tea towel. Maybe after the news, he said. Still writing about that woman who lives over the meat packing plant? Still writing. I'm near the end, though. What's that you've brought? He leaned over to the tray and lifted the towel, revealing two generous slices of apple strudel. Freshly baked, said Cyril's wife, crossing to the fireplace in the corner. A small dying flame flickered within. You could stoke the fire, you know, she said, tossing on a few logs. It's twenty-two below out there. They say we haven't had a cold snap like this in fifty years. And look at you. Instead of heating the room, you sit there with how many sweaters on? Three! I was just about to do that, said Cyril, biting into a piece of still hot strudel. Want to read what I wrote? Cyril's wife sat in an armchair under the skylight, its glass magnificently decorated with frost. Cyril opened the file containing his story and proceeded to read it aloud. So what do you say, he asked when he was through. Scary stuff, his wife exclaimed. Do you know how it'll end? All I know is I'm going to have her die, Cyril said. He fixed his wife with a long, inquiring look. She blinked back in surprise. You want me to suggest something? He smiled. Yes. Cyril enjoyed discussing his work. In fact, it was the best part about writing for him. He looked forward to hearing other people's point of view, even when it was critical. Sometimes he wished writing could be like soccer, where the players could tell right away from the way the fans reacted whether or not they liked their performance. The only critic of Cyril's initial literary efforts had been his mom. She would always fell asleep when she read. If she made it all the way through to the end of a story without yawning, then he knew it was perfect. But he didn't find his first truly loyal fan until after he got married. His wife loved to read, never fell asleep in the middle of turning a page, and was an obliging discussion partner. Cyril loved her for that, and realised that, in fact, he wrote mainly for her. She could jump out the window, his wife proposed. She lives on the third floor. I doubt it would be fatal. Besides, that's been done. How about she slit her wrists? No, no, never mind. You could have her overdose on sleeping pills. You know how you wrote she couldn't fall asleep at night because of the evil spirits? Or what if they smothered her with the duvet? 
She paused a moment. And you want her to die that same night? Yeah, Cyril said, shivering. The two of them stared at the floor, mulling it over. Print me out the last part and I'll read it through again, said Cyril's wife. Then come have a look at the news with me, and don't forget the tray. Okay, love, I've got the best fan in the world, you know that? Cyril's wife glanced back over her shoulder like the obligatory schoolgirl being flattered by an older boy. I know. After Cyril and his wife had finished watching the news, Cyril got up to go fetch some juice from the cellar. Wait for the weather, his wife said, holding him up. Do you know more than 30 homeless people have died because of the cold? I heard it on the radio this morning. Cyril sat back down on the couch. The mention of people freezing to death made him uneasy. It wasn't anything he could explain rationally. He remembered an article he had read once about precognition, a parapsychological phenomenon whereby, under certain circumstances, people who had the ability could see events in the future. It would often come to them in a dream, or like with Cyril just now, in connection with some offhand comment. He had always believed in the supernatural, though as a policeman he wasn't allowed to put too much stock in it, but now, being retired and writing a horror story, it was different. Hello, are you there? Cyril heard his wife's voice calling from the distance. Absently, he turned his head. Yes? The smiling face of the weather girl appeared on screen. She wore a heavy purple and white striped sweater and a knit cap with two fluffy pom-poms that dangled down over the rounded mounds of her breasts. Welcome to the weather forecast, she said. Icy Siberian winds from the northeast continue to prevail across the entire region, so be sure to dress warmly, and if you do go outside, try not to stay too long. Cyril held his breath. Most road surfaces remain frozen, so drivers should take extra precautions. We expect snow all night for elevations above 1,500 feet, with 6 to 8 inches of new snow in the mountains. The screen went dark, and a nighttime map of the country appeared behind the weather girl. The area around Zazaba, where Cyril and his wife lived, showed one of the lowest temperatures. Minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Cyril awkwardly hugged his wife. He wasn't sure why, but he was nervous all of a sudden. The uneasy feeling, precognition or whatever it was, wouldn't go away. Are you all right? asked Cyril's wife. I'm fine. Overnight temperatures in some parts of the country will drop to as low as 28 below zero. The girl in the knit cap drew a circle on the imaginary map with her fingers around the figure, minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Cyril frowned. He wasn't thrilled to be in the coldest part of the country. Anxiously, he cracked his knuckles on his right index finger, then began tapping his feet. Over the day, the temperature will climb to over minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit, but only briefly. The Siberian winds will continue to impact our region through the remainder of the week, and they are expecting the temperature may break the 100-year record. That's the weather. Wishing you a beautiful and peaceful Saturday night. Did you hear that? asked Cyril's wife. Awful, he confirmed. Even when I just go out for wood, she said, by the time I fill the basket, my hands are frozen to the bone. Cyril shuddered, swallowing on a dry throat. The mention of freezing cold temperatures frightened him for some reason. Precognition, foreknowledge of the future, like claws lurking in the shadows under your bed, but you went through life denying their existence, even though you knew they were there. How about taking some time off after the weekend, said Cyril. His wife worked part-time as a nursery school teacher, commuting to the other side of town every Wednesday, Thursday and Friday afternoon. Even if I want to, I can't. Two of the other teachers are sick, and they asked us to fill in. How come? I'm worried, Cyril admitted. It's just this sort of... He paused. I've got a bit of a headache. You just need some liquid in you. I'll go grab some juice. No, I'll go, Cyril blurted, a little louder than he had intended. 
He wasn't sure why, but the thought of his wife going out in the cold terrified him. And about Wednesday, please, just be careful. Don't worry, honey, the kids and I will turn the heat up nice and high, and after lunch we can crawl under the duvet. Cyril got up. For a moment or two he just stood there, focusing on his breath. Thankfully, the irrational fear he had that was making him so uncomfortable had gone away. He headed out to the hall, unlocked the door, and descended the stairs to the cellar. As a thick cloud of breath issued from his mouth, for some reason it reminded him of the woman in his story. Suddenly he knew he would have her freeze. Her room would turn ice cold while she huddled beneath the duvet. He couldn't help but smile. It must have been his story that was making him uneasy. He wondered if professional writers who wrote every day got anxious because of the scenes they were working on. Writing was real in a way too, wasn't it? At least as real as dreams. Neither one is tangible, something we can touch. And yet, isn't it the same to our brains? Suddenly Cyril was overcome with an urge to be upstairs in his study, to open Horror Story 1 and immerse himself in it one last time before going to sleep. It's an excellent story, he thought with pride. My mum would have read it without yawning even once. He pressed the switch to turn on the light. The bare bulb in the middle of the ceiling flooded the room with yellow light. Still, the cellar seemed darker than usual. Since a week ago, when the cold snap hit, Cyril had covered the windows with polystyrene boards. He crouched down and groped around the second shelf up from the ground. Just then a big spider dropped on the back of his hand. Cyril recoiled in fear. Spiders were one of the most repulsive creatures he knew of. He stared at the thing in disgust. It was frozen stiff, but clearly still alive. Cyril must have disturbed it from hibernation. The spider tried to straighten its long, lightly haired legs, but its movements were stiff and slow, like a robot that needs oiling. Cyril had no idea if the spider would freeze to death now that he'd interrupted its sleep, or whether it would make it through until spring. He didn't care. He took a jar of homemade raspberry juice from the shelf and left his cellar-dwelling tenant to its fate. Finally, Cyril sat down in his comfy chair and put his hands to the keyboard. It was quarter to nine. The study was freezing cold, but he didn't even think about lighting the fire. He liked warmth as much as anyone, but it was like there was a voice urging him not to, instead urging him to finish his story as soon as possible. The voice was both terrifying and exciting at the same time. He wondered if other writers heard the same voice when they were creating their masterpieces. His wife suddenly recalled his head. Beyond the damp sounds of television now, with the pencil in his hand, he reads again his unfinished story, and perhaps the way of the main heroine's death lies in her head. Cyril hurriedly opened the document titled Horror Story 1, hunched over his keyboard like a chess player concentrating on the decisive move of the living room, and started writing. The room was rectangular and small. The bed was in the corner, right next to the window, six, maybe nine feet away from the door. The woman lay curled up in bed like a person who's very cold. Then she suddenly realised, the room really has gotten colder. Dense white clouds of breath issued from her mouth. She continued to lie motionless under the duvet. Nothing yet had compelled her to move, to jump out of bed with her arms wrapped around her head for protection, to run downstairs as fast as she could, race down the hallway and bang open the back door leading outside. Not yet. She could feel the tension building, like a scene in a movie where a sinister melody plays in the background, so you know you're about to get scared out of your wits when the poor heroine opens the door with the murderer hiding behind it, holding a knife. The woman was too scared to even blink, for fear that what she saw when she opened her eyes would scare her out of her wits. What if, in that split second, somebody, something, stepped in front of her? The evil spirits. Creak. The woman began to shake uncontrollably, her body convulsing as if shot through with electricity. Her breathing quickened, the puffs of breath air billowing and dissipating faster and faster. They were in the room. Creak. Another footstep, slow and loud, heading toward her bed.
The woman stared teary-eyed with fear at the curtain in the window, pressing the duvet as tightly to her mouth as an oxygen supply. The curtain fluttered slightly, giving the impression there was someone walking past. She lifted her eyes and refocused on the window. The room, reflected in the glass, appeared very fuzzy. Creak! The evil spirit must have been standing at the foot of her bed now. He would only need to bend over, reach under the covers, and grasp one of her ankles with his cold, soft fingers. She kept her focus on the glass in the window. The reflection of the room was slowly becoming clearer. Suddenly, her heart stopped in terror. In the middle of the room, she could make out the black shadow of a human figure. Greek. I've got it! Cyril's wife beamed as he slipped into bed with her an hour later. I thought you were asleep. No, I read your story again, and now I know how she dies. She waved the printed stack of paper in his face triumphantly. Go on, I'm curious, Cyril said. Your hands are freezing, his wife frowned. Didn't you light the fire? I guess I forgot, he said in an apologetic tone. So what did you come up with? Well, she lives above a meat packing plant, which always has a freezer room, right? Cyril nodded. So I was thinking the evil spirits could chase her into the freezer and lock her in. I was thinking you could have her freeze to death. Cyril stared straight ahead for a good long time. His wife's words gave him the same uneasy feeling he'd had watching the weather forecast. Precognition, foreknowledge of the future. Freeze to death, he stuttered. Yeah, doesn't that sound like a good idea? Cyril agreed. It sounded like a very good idea. But again, as with the spider, today, for some reason, the cold seems scary to him. I had pictured her dying some other way, he said. Cyril had absolutely made up his mind to have his heroine freeze to death, but he wanted to push his wife to see how strongly she stood behind the idea. Something gorier, you know, have the evil spirits tear her to pieces, say, or chop her up. That's the way the main character dies in a bee horror flick, Cyril's wife objected. Have her freeze. Describe how she feels. You're good at that. Describe how she feels when she discovers the door won't open and the temperature inside is 18 below and she knows she won't make it till morning. Write about how she wanders through all the carcasses hanging from hooks, trying to find another way out, but there is none. It dawns on her that she's got no hope of being rescued. And then... Cyril watched, captivated as his wife excitedly described the ending of the story. He felt the hairs prickling on the back of his neck. And then she notices the thermometer, long and white, except for the degree marks in blue. Not blue like water, though, but blue like ice, so it torments her to look at it. Get it? Cyril got it. Hearing her now, he understood exactly how his wife thought, as if their minds were connected. He imagined the desperation his main character felt, the tears freezing on her cheeks as she turned blue with cold. The muffled sounds of the evil spirits on the other side of the locked door, moving furniture around, flipping chairs and smashing mirrors. He could feel their wrathful joy. He could feel it and longed to write it down. And then she notices the dark red alcohol in the thermometer. Cyril's wife went on, oblivious to the vacant look in her husband's eyes. And with horror, she watches it slowly drop, bit by bit, lower and lower. Minus five, minus ten, minus fifteen, minus twenty. And the whole time she's watching the thermometer in her head, she's going over what she knows about freezing to death. Put down that she read somewhere that it hurts at first, but after a while the pain stops. Put down that she read people start to feel overheated just before they freeze to death. 
and they die in their sleep, when tiny ice crystals form in their blood and clog up their heart. You have to show that she knows about freezing to death. It has to be obvious she's afraid, since the more people can picture what's going to happen to them, the more scared they are. Cyril was itching to get back to his study and finish the story right away. Those uneasy feelings he'd had watching the evening news weren't precognition. It was just his subconscious trying to tell him what to write. His trip down to the cellar for juice, the hibernating spider, his fear about his wife going to work. Even the fact that the worst winter in the last hundred years was raging outside. All of it was calling out to him, urging him, have her freeze. So will you do it? asked his wife. Okay, he said, exhaling. He gave her a kiss on the hair. I'll do it. Morning came icy cold, the last Sunday in January. Cyril ate breakfast, but barely tasted the roll with jam and strong bitter coffee. Something, maybe the writer's muse, was driving him to get out of bed, sit down at the computer and write. Here I go, he told his wife. You're going to have her freeze? His wife checked one more time. Yes. Good, it just feels like how it needs to be, like it's her destiny, you know. I know, that's how I feel too, Cyril said. Don't forget to make a fire. Cyril walked away without a word. He had been writing about half an hour when a knock came at the door. You rascal, I knew you wouldn't do it, his wife said, gesturing to the cold fireplace. Cyril muttered something under his breath. She could tell he didn't want to be disturbed. She set a fresh cup of coffee down beside him and lighted the fire herself. Sorry, she squeaked, then slunk out the door. Cyril heard the muffled creak of the stairs. Frowning at the cursor blinking in the middle of an unfinished sentence, he cocked his index fingers like two threatening writerly weapons and dove back into his story. She could see it clear as day, the shadow of a human figure reflected in the window pane like a bottomless hole in the earth, like a dark, damp grave. An evil spirit. It stood in the middle of her room, unmoving. It seemed to be admiring the shape of her body underneath the covers, feeding on the fear that emanated from her. Slowly the shadow bent forward, and as it did, the lower part of the duvet grew heavy. The woman's eyes snapped open as she felt the duvet begin to rise. She hugged her knees to her chin, breathing rapidly. Her forehead wrinkled and her pupils dilated in terror. A warm sensation flooded her thighs. She had wet herself. The cold night air brushed across the soles of her feet as the duvet climbed higher and higher. Bit by bit, the shadow exposed her curled toes, ankles and calves. She decided to make a run for it. She flexed her muscles and rolled to the ground, banging her right knee with her elbow in the process, but she ignored the pain. What mattered now was speed. Shielding her face with her hands, she bolted out of the room, hoping not to hear the creak of the floorboard behind her. But the footsteps followed. Creak, creak. There was a noise from the stairs. She thought she was in a long workroom, crowded with loud machines working at full tilt. She heard voices coming through the walls, furniture scraping across the floor, and she also clearly heard him, her pursuer. She shrieked in horror and sprinted ahead. It felt like she was in a race for her life. Every time, up to now, she had won, but this time it seemed the evil spirit wasn't about to give up. She dashed down the stairs and raced through the hallway, which was normally always lighted, but now the light was out. She was headed for the back door, which she left open every night to make sure she had an escape route. She pulled on the door handle. Locked. It felt like a punch to the gut. 
How could that be? She had just checked it. She wheeled around and saw the shadow. It stood at the far end of the hallway, blocking the only way out. She realised it had chased her into a dead end, and it knew it. Anxiously, the woman watched as the evil spirit strode towards her. It wasn't in a hurry, as if it knew there was no need. The woman wondered if there was still any hope. The hallway in front of her was completely empty. Bare walls, no carpet on the floor. Just then she remembered there was a door on the right, halfway down, and she knew where it led to, the freezer room. She'd never used the door. The meatpacking employees locked it at the end of every day, but now she had no choice but to try. She made a desperate dash for the door. That meant she was also running straight towards the shadow, less than 30 feet away, but the woman pushed down her fear. She clutched wildly at the handle, resembling a slide bolt. It was cold as ice. She slid back the latch and the door gave way. Quickly, she slipped inside and slammed the door behind her. She was surrounded by total darkness. She took two uncertain steps, then stopped. She heard the sound of footsteps. They reached the door, then stopped. The next sound she heard was the click of a lock. Cyril read back through everything he had written. He grinned triumphantly. He felt like a tennis player stepping up to serve on match point after hours of grueling play. All he had left to write now was the ending. But he decided to leave the scene in which he described his heroine's death until evening. He didn't want to rush it. His creative burst had fizzled out and he knew it was time for lunch and the Sunday grocery run. So how was Cooking coming along, Cyril asked his better half, who was stirring a pot of sauce on the stove. He stepped in close, kissing her tenderly on the neck. How's the story coming along, she asked back. She's in the freezer, he grinned mischievously. Are you going to write any more tonight? Absolutely, I'd like to finish it up. Cyril scooped up a spoonful of sauce, put it to his lips and slurped. Ouch, that's hot. You should know by now when it's steaming, it isn't going to be cold, my dear. His wife laughed as he pressed the back of his hand to his injured lip. That story of yours has got you all confused. You're so caught up in how you're going to get your gal in the freezer that you forgot things burn when they're hot. Cyril smiled. His lip had stopped throbbing. He rubbed his wife on the back and said, It's delicious. By the time they got home from shopping, it was half past five. Cyril ran a hot bath and climbed into the tub. After the long, cold drive home, he needed to warm up. Don't you fall asleep in there. I want a bath too. I was thinking about the ending of my story, he said by way of apology as he opened the bathroom door and a cloud of steam billowed out. Did you look at the forecast? Still freezing, his wife sighed. Down to minus 30 by morning. Damn weather, Cyril said. What is this, Siberia? I'll be upstairs. Make sure you light the fire. Cyril went to the kitchen, brewed a pot of coffee, poured a bag of coconut cookies onto a plate and looked at the digital clock. 6.04 p.m. He heard his wife turn off the water in the bathroom. He picked up the coffee and cookies and walked off to his study, feeling a tingle of excitement in his belly. The attic room was as cold as an Eskimo igloo. Cyril went to the fireplace and threw four logs on. Last ones left, he realised. But he didn't feel like going out for more, especially not when he had something so important to do. The flames were already flickering away. He would be warm soon enough. The retired policeman sat down in his chair, hunched over his keyboard and began to write. Dressed in nothing but a thin cotton nightgown, she huddled in the total darkness of the huge freezer room. She took another step and crashed into a side of deer suspended in midair. A cry escaped her throat. It's only an animal, just an animal, she repeated out loud to herself, trying to calm down. You're in a warehouse where they keep wild game for processing. But then she realised. 
there was nothing calming about what she was saying. She was in a warehouse. However, it also served as a freezer. Morning was still hours away and the spirits had locked her in. No way to get out, no way to warm up. She felt her way back to the door and grasped hold of the handle. The handle moved, but the door didn't budge. Don't panic. The main thing is don't panic, she commanded herself under her breath. Her teeth chattered as she rubbed her hands up and down her arms. You'll find a way out, and even if not, you can hold out till morning when they come to open up. But despite all the soothing words, she knew she was lying to herself. It was just wishful thinking. It wasn't the truth. Unless help came, she would freeze to death before morning. Cyril's wife finished her bath. It was only 6.30, but outside it was dark as the inside of a coffin. She climbed the stairs to the door of Cyril's study, drying her hair along the way. It's nice and warm in here, she uttered in surprise. Cyril wasn't happy to be interrupted. His wife's presence annoyed him the way people are annoyed by a fly buzzing around the room when they're trying to fall asleep. He had finally reached the state of elation where his fingers couldn't keep up with the flow of words from his brain, and he didn't want to stop. The logs ran out. Can you go grab some more? He grumbled. His wife picked up the empty basket and stroked him on the shoulder. Cyril growled like a dog being touched while eating. I'll be right back and won't disturb you any more after that, I promise. Cyril wasn't listening. Deep in his writerly trance, his eyes were fixed on his two spasmodically extended fingers, pounding away at the keyboard like a pair of telegraph hammers. Every few minutes, he lifted his gaze to the screen of his computer, thickening with sentences. His wife's words dissipated from his mind like smoke from a candle. Cyril's wife entered the kitchen. She set the basket down on the ceramic tiling, lifted a mug from the table, the one with the smiley face sun tanning itself on the beach, and took a gulp of lukewarm tea. She was still in her bathrobe. She stood a moment staring into the dark outside the window, then went into the bedroom to get dressed. Next, propping the basket against her hip, she went downstairs to the basement and put on her old winter jacket. She wondered if she shouldn't also grab a cap and proper boots. It was minus 18 degrees out after all, and her hair was still partially wet from the bath. Finally, she decided against it. Filling the basket won't take me more than a minute max, she thought. With the trip there and back, I'll be outside two minutes, maybe two and a half. She stepped into an old pair of beat-up sneakers and continued on toward the door across the warped linoleum. Just before she reached the door, she pulled up short. A strange feeling of uneasiness suddenly came over her, like a warning not to go on, to turn around and go back to the warmth of the heated kitchen. Cyril's wife wasn't a superstitious woman. She didn't page through dream books looking to interpret her dreams or consult the horoscope every day to learn what lay in store for her. Yet at that moment, she felt like maybe she should believe in those things, at least right now. She stopped, shook her head, opened the door and stepped out into the freezing cold night. She choked as she took in her first icy breath. Instinctively, she hunched her head into her shoulders as she pattered down the snowy path that led out back of the house where the firewood was stacked. The Clements lived in the last house at the end of a long road on a plot of land surrounded by meadows on three sides. Their neighbours on the fourth side with the apple orchard were off sunbathing in Copacabana. Cyril's wife could feel the cold starting to creep beneath her sweater. Winter knows no shame, she thought with uncharacteristic severity and stepped up her pace. She passed Cyril's scaffolding, leaning in a tall stack against the side of the house. In the dark, the snow-covered tubing looked like a military barricade constructed of giant thigh bones. It reminded her of the famous bone church in Kutnohora, a relic of the 14th century plague epidemics 
and the Hussite Wars of the early 15th century. She had visited the church with her parents as a child, and the experience had stayed with her. Bones on every surface, long, short, flat, and all those skulls, garlands, tapestries, and even a chandelier. Beautiful in a morbid way, she had thought. For the first time in her life, she had realised she was neither immortal nor exceptional and that one day all that would remain of her was a sack of bleached bones. She ran down the three wooden stairs and headed around the corner where she laid down the basket and quickly began to fill it with wood. Tossing the logs from the pile, she missed several times and had to pick them up again. She could feel the stab of the cold underneath her fingernails. As soon as she was finished... She grabbed the basket and started back. It happened as she was hurrying up the steps. The worn, slick sole of her sneakers slipped and she fell. She slammed into the base of the near-vertical stack of scaffolding, causing the pipes to tip toward her with a metallic screech. They teetered a moment, as if trying to decide whether to collapse or not. Then the giant thigh bones came crashing down with a thunderous roar. Cyril's wife screamed and covered her face. She felt the impact, then dead weight. Lying on her back, pinned beneath hundreds of pounds of steel, she was horrified to discover that not only could she not move, but she was barely able to breathe. The cold bones had her trapped in their clutches the way a child wraps their hand around a grasshopper to keep it from jumping free. They had a firm grip on her, with no intention of letting go. The skylight shone bright in the midst of the dark icy night. Viewed from above, it looked like a fallen sister to the millions of glittering stars in the sky, fallen and forgotten on earth. Through the skylight, a grey-haired gentleman in slippers sat hunched in concentration at his keyboard, tapping out an asymmetrical rhythm in synchrony with the flow of his thoughts. A short while ago, he had put on a third sweater. The room was getting cold, the fire was dying out, and the half-drunk cup of coffee to his right had long since gone cold. Cyril didn't think anything of the fact that his wife hadn't come back, that she hadn't returned to throw on fresh wood, peek over his shoulder and give him a rub on the back. He was so immersed in his story, he didn't notice the outside world. He didn't hear the icy gusts of wind outside the window, the occasional crack of a knot from the fire, or the loud screech from the pile of steel that had just collapsed. His main character was dying under his hands, his first heroine. Over the course of the week, he had spent writing the story he formed a near personal bond with her. Though he had yet to give her a name, somewhere deep down inside, he felt she was a real person, a human being of flesh and blood who was at his mercy, who stood with tears in her eyes, waiting for him to kill her, slowly and cruelly, wowing the readers of his book with his talent, imagination and craft. Describe how she feels. You're good at that. Cyril remembered his wife's words. He knew it was true. The woman squatted on the floor in total darkness. Her teeth were chattering so hard she was surprised they hadn't cracked. It was all the evil spirit's fault. They haunted her every night. Sometimes they paid more attention to her, sometimes nearly none at all. But they were never far away. And there was nothing she could do about it. They had been haunting her since childhood. They were a curse, a stigma, the punishment for a sin she hadn't committed. Every time she had moved, they had moved with her. Whenever she tried to forget they existed, they reminded her. And now at last, they had her. Somebody turned on the lights. A bright glow flooded the room. The woman momentarily stopped shaking and, dazzled by the glare, peered around through slitted eyes. Frozen animals lay splayed across the white paved floor, but most of them hung from hooks. Sixty-pound pigs, deer, pheasants. She saw death surrounding her. And with a harsh finality, 
she understood that by morning she too would be just another dead animal. Just then, she noticed the thermometer, long and white with blue numbers. Not blue like water, blue like ice. She tried with frozen fingers to wipe away the layer of frost hiding the scale, but ended up having to scrape it off using her nails. Her jaw dropped in silent horror. Minus 18 degrees. Cyril stretched. It was coming along great. His wife's idea for the thermometer fit the story like a key in a lock. The ending would be terrifying, gripping and impossible to put down. Cyril knew exactly what he wanted to write. He also had to admit, with an unsettling fear, he couldn't quite explain that the story felt real. Too damn real. Cyril's wife lay trapped beneath the hundreds of pounds of scaffolding. She couldn't move from the waist down. Both her wrists were in pain, and her wet hair had frozen to the ground. Cyril, she cried. Cyril, help me. He could not. In his mind, Cyril was with his main character, and his wife's cries were nothing but the faraway howl of the icy January wind. Cyril's wife screamed for help a good full minute, then stopped, panting in exhaustion. She stared at the millions of stars up above in the sky, then leaned her head back and started to cry as all at once it hit her. Her husband was inside writing about a woman freezing to death, and she was the one who had given him the idea. I was thinking you could have her freeze to death. Those had been her words. She had lost feelings in her fingers. The chill from the ground had frozen her to the bone. And the minutes were ticking away. Describe how she feels when she discovers the door won't open and the temperature inside is 18 below and she knows she won't make it till morning. If only she had known. Suddenly it began to sink in that she really wouldn't make it till morning. She would freeze to death before then. Cyril wasn't going to come. He was too wrapped up in his writing. He assumed she had gone to bed or was watching TV. What did he care? She had promised to be right back, but there was no reason for him to think it was odd that she hadn't. In fact, he was grateful to her for not interrupting with another intrusive knock at the door. The heroine of Cyril's story, whom he had never named, seemed closer to her than ever now. Now he's having us both freeze to death, Cyril's wife thought. She noticed the dark red alcohol and watched with horror as it dropped inside the tube, minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. A few seconds of apparent inactivity, minus 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Tears began to stream from her eyes, she nervously licked her lips. The saliva, like the tears on her cheeks, froze instantly. Minus 31. Minus 32. Minus 33. She wondered how long she had been locked in now. Five minutes? Ten? How long before she loses feeling in her fingers? Can the mucous membrane on your eyes freeze? What about the fluid inside? Does that freeze too? Minus 38, minus 39, minus 40. The cold hurt, even though she had read somewhere that it didn't. The air burned her bronchi, stabbing into her lungs like thumbtacks. Then she heard the sound of laughter from the hallway, the mad laughter of the spirits who had finally won Minus 54, minus 55, minus 56. Cyril went on writing. His only thought was to finish his story. Some voice or muse was keeping him down a path no one had ever travelled before, urging him not to stop. Keep going. It was 7.01. His wife had been outside ten minutes now. Her cries for help had warmed her a little, but she soon realised it was useless. And then she notices the dark red alcohol in the thermometer 
and with horror she watches it slowly drop, bit by bit, lower and lower. That was exactly how she had described it to Cyril in bed yesterday. She felt an odd excitement on recollecting the memory, and suddenly she knew why. She was lying below the kitchen window. And right outside the window, on the corner of the house, she knew she would see it even before she looked. A thermometer, an outdoor thermometer, illuminated from the kitchen inside, just for her. Minus 18 it read, just as she had foretold. Cyril's wife could see the number sharp and clear, and for the first time it dawned on her that two days ago, lying in bed, in fact this very morning, she had excitedly recounted the circumstances of her own death. It just feels like that's how it needs to be, like it's her destiny, you know? Her fingers ached with cold. She tried to warm them by clenching her hand into a fist and then opening it up again, but it was slow going. Her fingers refused to obey the signals from her nervous system, like the spider in the cellar. And the whole time she's watching the thermometer in her head, she's going over what she knows about freezing to death. Cyril's wife was in fact going over everything she knew about freezing to death. Her fingers could no longer grip. Even with the greatest effort, she could move them only about an inch. She was losing feeling in her other extremities too. Ears, nose, feet. She could hear her heart forced to beat harder by the excess of adrenaline. She knew before long it would stop. As soon as the build-up of ice crystals clogged the vessels leading to one of the chambers. But all of a sudden, her heart started pounding even harder and her pupils widened in terror as the red line in the thermometer began to drop. Slowly, it sank. Minus 20, minus 21, minus 22, minus 23. Minus 24, minus 25, minus 26. The weathercaster's words from earlier that day surfaced in her mind. Overnight temperatures will drop to 22 degrees below zero, with lows as cold as minus 31 in some places toward morning. To a mine, Grace, Cyril's wife mumbled through frozen lips. Here is, here is, help me. Suddenly she stopped. She couldn't believe her eyes. The temperature was still dropping. It was almost minus 40 degrees now. My God, she gasped. She just stared, hypnotized for nearly a minute. She forgot all about the pain from the cold. She forgot her bruised wrists and unfeeling extremities. What she didn't forget, however, was Cyril and his story. She pictured his main character squatting behind the locked door listening to the sound of furniture being moved around and dishes being broken. And at the same time, she imagined she could hear Cyril, like an evil spirit, pecking away at the keyboard and tapping his feet. She could hear him. The last time she looked at the thermometer, she wasn't even surprised that there was no longer any red left. The lowest measurable temperature, she recalled, was minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. She closed her eyes.